Three different planes experience the same devastating situation. What the hell? Engines detaching mid-air. Looks like we've lost number one. Clear an emergency. They didn't even know the engine was actually gone. Each case has vastly different consequences. Nothing. The throttle cables must be cut. We're losing hydraulics on system three. No, three and four. 300 feet, we're losing altitude. Three separate crews must use all their skills to get their passengers to the ground safely. On a clear Friday afternoon, the crew of American Airlines Flight 191 Rudder set. prepares for takeoff. Spoilers are from Chicago's O'Hare Airport. Any updates on the weather? Captain Walter Lux is a seasoned pilot with 22,000 flying hours. Surface wind 20 degrees at 22 knots. Nothing but blue skies. He and First Officer James Dillard are piloting a DC-10. Its three-engine configuration makes it one of the most recognizable jets on the runway. The 258 passengers settle in for the flight to Los Angeles. The one rotate. the turbulence. Not too rough. Did you see that? I've lost power to my side. The captain's instrument panel has gone dark. Looks like we've lost number one. Power in the left engine has gone. You have to keep going. You have to climb out. And if there's something wrong with the airplane, even if the problems are critical, your best hope is to keep going, to climb, contact ATC, and come around and land somehow, somewhere. Look at this. Look at this. Right away, the air traffic controller spots trouble. Equipment. I need equipment. Blew an engine. We're back. Go right. Go right. The plane is just 325 feet from the ground, but it's banking sharply to the left. I can't hold it. What's going on? The pilots can't achieve the altitude they need, and they bank even further. I'm losing it! Go right, go right, come on, come on! 300 feet, we're losing altitude. Witnesses on the ground can clearly see Flight 191 flying on its side. We're still turning! Level, baby, level! Brace, brace, brace! There he goes. The DC-10 slams into a hangar at the edge of the airport. The plane's loaded fuel tanks spark a terrifying inferno. Thirty-one seconds after takeoff, almost nothing is left of Flight 191. All 271 people on board are dead. Two workers inside the hangar are also killed. It's the worst aviation disaster in US history. A lot of people saw this happen. Let's see what they can tell us. The NTSB America's National Transportation Safety Board is called in to investigate what went wrong. They start with the controller who witnessed the shocking incident. Look at this. Look, look at this. The air traffic controller reveals that Flight 191's left engine did more than fail. The engine fell off the plane just after they lifted off. 
If you were sitting on the left-hand side of the airplane, what you would have seen was the number one engine on the left side rotated up and flipped back and disappeared behind you. Did you see that? These engines are actually designed to go back up over the wing in case of failure so that they will miss the tail as they go by and not cause damage to the tail section. Investigators scour the wreckage for clues about when the engines separated. Well, my first priorities would be to look at the actual separation. Where is it that this engine broke? This is definitely part of the pylon. I've never seen one break like that. The pylons are mounted under the wings. Each one is strong enough to suspend an engine weighing 11,700 pounds. The pylon is designed very well strength-wise. You take a lot of load, much more load than you would normally see in the course of the uh, airplane life. The pylon gets its strength from two internal bulkheads, one forward and one rear. The bulkheads also provide secure points of attachment ensuring that the engines are firmly fixed to the wings. It's almost inconceivable that one of the strongest parts of the aircraft, with its fail-safe design, could break apart. Andy, what happened? I need to see the rest of the pylon. While experts recover the rest of the broken pylon, investigators cross-check the aircraft's maintenance records they discover that the left engine was removed for servicing eight weeks prior to the crash. Any time that you have an airplane that's been into maintenance uh, just before a crash, that also raises all sorts of uh, warning flags, all sorts. Uh, go down to Tulsa. See what they did. If you have an investigation that involves maintenance, you don't go inside the hangar, you don't follow that trail, you're going to miss some issues. The team splits. One group follows the maintenance trail for clues. The other stays behind to piece together the broken pylon. See, that had to happen before the crash. Just don't know why. Close examination reveals a crack in the metal. It's a telltale sign that the pylon bulkhead was already damaged before the crash. You can see where it's spread. All along there. The crack runs along the top edge of the rear bulkhead. The cracks were consistent with a fatigue phenomenon from repeated loads. Each time the load occurs, you then have an extension of the crack. And there's another clue, a dent on the pylon bulkhead right where the crack seems to start. Looks like something hit the pylon. Okay, I'll see what I can find. In Tulsa, investigators observe another DC-10 undergoing the same maintenance that was performed on Flight 191. Can you take me up and show me how the engine's mounted? Okay, bring her up! They discover that to save time, the airline modified a key maintenance procedure. Servicing an engine usually involves removing it from the pylon and leaving the pylon attached to the wing. It requires unfastening hundreds of connections. Procedures from the manufacturer were deemed to be too time-consuming, and they could do it faster, better, cheaper. The quicker way involves taking out just three bolts. The engine can then be removed from the wing while still attached to the pylon. It was easier. The attach points from the pylon to the wing were accessible, the attach points from the engine to the pylon were much more difficult to take apart and put back together. Removing's not the issue, it's the attempt to reinstall. Whoa, stop! Is where the problem comes from. Left a bit. Now up! They were using the forklift, and this forklift is not very manageable. It, it cannot be finely controlled as far as the altitude is concerned. Whoa, stop, stop! I think I know what happened. Take her down. The team is on the verge of discovering how a mysterious dent in an engine pylon set off a catastrophic chain of events. I can't hold it! What do you got? 
NTSB investigators learned that a maintenance crew struggled to reattach the pylon into the mounting bracket, or clevis, of Flight 191 just weeks before the crash. And, and then it all came together. The clevis itself had produced this deformation that was on the fracture. The team concludes that the clevis on the doomed plane must have slammed into the pylon bulkhead as the engine was being reattached. The impact could have initiated the crack that led to the pylon's failure. Each time the plane took off, the stress that the massive engine put on the pylon made the crack larger. The engine is not only imparting a thrust load, but it's also imparting a sideways load. So each time you have this load, it breaks a little bit more and more and more. The team now understands what caused the engine to tear off. But that doesn't explain why Captain Lux wasn't able to land. The plane was in bad shape. It had lost an engine. It had lost several critical systems. But it was still airworthy. It was still able to fly. In fact, uh, you could lose a second engine shortly after liftoff, and you would still be able to power the aircraft around. Photos taken just before the crash provide investigators with a vital clue. Is that hydraulic fluid? Several of the DC-10's hydraulic lines run along the leading edge of the wing. Take a look at this. It's the area that was damaged the most when the engine broke off. We need to see those slats. American 191, thank you. Taxi and hold, runway 32 right. Flaps and slats to 10. Deployed at takeoff, the slats increase the wing's surface area, which enables pilots to climb at lower speeds. Investigators discover that while all the slats on the right wing were extended, some slats on the left wing were not. You have one wing that is flying and the other wing that isn't. The team determines that the engine tore away from the wing with enough force to rupture the hydraulic lines. The fluid keeping the slats extended on the left wing would have drained quickly. I can't hold it! Without fluid, some slats on the left wing retracted, causing that wing to lose lift. The plane began to roll left. I'm losing it! Without full slats, the plane had required a higher speed to avoid stalling. So why didn't the experienced pilots increase speed if they were about to stall? To find out, investigators recreate the takeoff in a simulator. There is a stall warning system that will advise the pilots when the airplane is about to stall. It's called a stick shaker. The stick shaker vibrates the control column to get the pilot's attention. If you get a stall warning, you obviously lower the nose and you apply full power and you fly it out of the stall. Investigators examine the DC-10 stall warning. They make an important discovery. Well, the alarms are powered by the left engine. Once the engine broke off, the stick shaker stall warning went dead. I've lost power to my side. We're banking. Go right, go right. Without that warning, the pilots didn't know their plane was stalling. Instead, they followed procedures for an engine failure on takeoff. We're taught to pull back on the wheel and go back to the minimum safe flying speed to get away from the ground. Reducing speed is the opposite of what pilots need to do when a plane is about to stall. If they didn't know they were stalling, they didn't stand a chance. The pilots flew the plane exactly as they'd been trained to do, exactly as procedure demanded that they fly. The NTSB concludes the pilots were not at fault. They do, however, fault American Airlines maintenance practices. Are you the captain of Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Bailey now. The Federal Aviation Administration is also singled out for not enforcing the installation of stick shakers on both columns and for not mandating that warning systems be powered by more than one engine. 
The DC-10's hydraulics are also redesigned with special plugs to prevent slats and other control surfaces from retracting if the lines get cut. When uh, pilots say lose an engine, we mean lose engine power. This plane actually lost an engine. This kind of accident never happened again. This engine never fell off this kind of airplane again. Though the DC-10 never lost another engine, it takes only a few years for a different aircraft to face the same terrifying event. In Cold Bay, Alaska, Revolution Airlines Flight 8 is set for takeoff. Destination, Seattle, Washington. The route will take the plane over a wide area of the icy North Pacific. Captain James Gibson is a hardened bush pilot with more than 25 years experience. Set takeoff thrust. Gibson's flight engineer. Thrust set is 45-year-old Alaskan Gerald Moose Lauren. His first officer is 39-year-old Gary Lintner. Generally, we flew that route once a week. On this particular day, we were scheduled for five hours of flying time. Gear up. Gear up. They're flying a Lockheed L-188 Electra powered by four turboprop engines. Gibson completes the turn on a course bound for Seattle when an unusual vibration resonates throughout the cockpit. You hear that, Gary? I do. I know. Moose, have a look with you. Yeah, you bet. Flight attendant Wendy Croon helps Lauren check the engines. And just as I looked out the window, the engine went. As the prop came off, I thought, oh crap, it's going to kill me. It's going to cut me in two. But it flew forward, and then it came back and slapped the engine, and then went underneath. A gash in the fuselage has caused an explosive decompression. Gap pressure dropping. The rapid change in air pressure and temperature creates heavy fog and starves the plane of oxygen. You end up uh, getting lightheaded and you can actually pass out. The pilots must act quickly to have any chance of saving the plane. In the cockpit of Revolutions Flight 8, Captain Gibson and First Officer Lindner attempt to regain control of the aircraft. When the fog cleared, I saw out the window that we were in the right turn. The damaged plane has veered off course and is now flying northwest towards the Bering Sea. And so I naturally grabbed the yoke to try to level the wings. Jim! No ailerons either. It felt like the yoke was in concrete. It just felt solid as a concrete block. Meanwhile, Wendy Croon and Moose Lauren spring into action. My first thoughts were get the passengers to the back of the airplane. But the gash in the cabin floor tells her everyone must stay put. I had a really bad feeling. I stopped with one foot still in the air. Fear just ran through me. I'm looking straight down at my foot over a hole, straight down to the ocean. In the cockpit, a jammed control column Don't. won't let the pilots descend to a lower altitude where there's more oxygen. Everybody, calm down. Just a second. Gibson tries the autopilot. It's working. The pilots realize the cables controlling manual operations are jammed. But those for the autopilot seem to be functional. Wings level. Captain Gibson sets the autopilot to keep the plane flying a steady and descending course. Now he needs to slow it down. Its high speed could tear the damaged plane to pieces. Full power back to 2000. Look! Nothing! When his hand moved those throttles back and the horsepower gauges didn't move, I 
Boy, I'll tell you what, I said, man, I wish I'd have called in sick. This is about as bad as it can get. The throttle cables must be cut. The pilots can't reduce their speed. Let's see if we can get turned around. Gibson sets the autopilot to make a right turn back towards Cold Bay. But the plane goes into a rapid rolling turn. The autopilot's lateral control must also be damaged. It scared the living crap out of all of us. Gibson has no way of steering his airplane. The crew and passengers are heading straight out to sea. Clear an emergency. Mayday, mayday. This is late Friday. Flight dispatcher Richard Huff receives the call at the Reeve base in Anchorage. Reeve aid, understand. No flight control. Confirm. No, 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 negative. We got no manual control, but uh, autopilot, vertical control, kind of working. Uh, Approaching 10,000 feet. Dropping at 10,000 feet. Okay, we got you. The autopilot brings the Electra down low enough for everyone to breathe comfortably. Thank God. It's now safe to remove your masks. Yet Gibson still can't move his column enough to turn back. And I thought, well, hell, maybe I can do that. So I reached up and I grabbed the yoke and I just, I moved it. Whoa. Lindner moves his column just enough to turn the plane slightly. Now at least we knew that we could overpower or help the autopilot. So that meant that probably our control cables were not severed. The pilots combined their muscle to force the plane into a right bank towards Cold Bay. The wide turn will get the plane on course, but won't provide the precision needed to touch down. We can't land like this. No chance in hell. The older Electra is not equipped to land on autopilot. The landing has to be performed manually. But there's a bigger problem. The plane is still traveling too fast to land. The captain needs a longer runway. Breathe eight dispatch. Considered flight direct to Anchorage. Over. Richard Huff proposes something risky. Fly 440 miles northeast towards Anchorage Airport, which has two long runways. This thing's a damn tank. We'll make it. OK, dispatch. We are flying to Anchorage. The controls were just real stiff, and all we knew was that as long as we tried to use the autopilot and manually helped, that we could fly the airplane a little bit. It takes four hours for the crew of Flight 8 to get within sight of the runway. But they still don't have the manual control needed to touch down. Dispatch, rebate. Hang on. Okay. I gotta get some controls back where I absolutely cannot land. Over. Fifteen lives depend on the pilot's skill grappling with the unpredictable aircraft. Hours of wrestling with the damaged controls have taken their toll on the captain. Gary, I'm done. You gotta take it. As Lindner takes control, he notices something that changes the entire situation. I suddenly saw that the autopilot was off. It's, it's turned off. There are two sets of flight control cables on the Electra. One set for the autopilot and one for manual control. They work independently of each other. Somehow, Lindner is hand flying the plane without the help of the autopilot. And I turned to Jim and I said, hey, I've got control here. What? Man, immediately he grabbed the yoke and the two of us got on it. And with the two of us, hell, we had pretty good control. The pilots can now pitch the nose up and can accurately line up with the runway. As long as we have manual control over the airplane without the autopilot, we'll deal with the rest. But this doesn't solve all of their problems. The plane is still flying too fast to land safely. So Gibson tries shutting down one of the engines. OK, Moose, kill number two. You've reached the shutdown, engine number two. Their speed drops, but not enough. Our problem was that we were just going too fast. Gibson cannot slow down the speeding plane, but he must land the plane now. 
It's his only chance to save everyone on board. Let's do this. Reeve Flight 8 is moments from touching down. Anchorage, Reeve 8, ready to land, runway 6 right. Gear down! Gear down! But with two engines stuck on full throttle, landing at 160 knots could cause a fatal crash. The plane hits the ground 15 knots faster than it should. Gibson needs to act fast. Cut all engines! Emergency shutdown engines one and three! It's a risky move. Cutting the engines slows the aircraft, but it also severs power to the hydraulic brakes and the steering. I mean, we're, we're essentially passengers now. We've become passengers with front row seats. The plane hurtles forward at tremendous speed. All Gibson has left to try are the emergency brakes, and they don't have nearly as much stopping power as the main brakes. The emergency brakes burst into flames. We have a fire on the nose wheel. Now we're going off the runway. We're definitely going off the runway. We're just looking straight into that ditch. Brace yourself! The terrifying ordeal is finally over. Captain Gibson and his crew have landed a shattered plane and saved the lives of everyone on board. Sometimes pilots have to fly by the seat of their pants and they have to rely on their instincts. But what is that really? It's experience and training. The exceptional airmanship of Flight 8's crew prevented tragedy on the runway. Now it's up to the NTSB and lead investigator Ron Schleed to find out what happened to bring Reeve Flight 8 so close to disaster. They study the wrecked plane. The wreckage really didn't give us much of a clue uh, because what we needed to look at was gone. The propeller and the gearbox it was attached to are both lost at sea. The team turns to the flight data recorder, but it too is of little use in determining why the engine tore off in midair. The flight recorder on this airplane was a very rudimentary recorder. It, it records by a stylus scraping a metal foil. And so it's not a very scientific thing compared to what we have today. But they still have to answer the crucial question. Why was Gibson's plane so hard to control? The loss of a propeller is not necessarily catastrophic. It's designed to fly with only half its engines. And still, with three engines intact, Gibson could barely maneuver the plane. NTSB investigators examined the gash where the propeller punctured the hull. Doesn't look like any cables are cut. It's only by taking a closer look at the tear from inside the cabin that they finally discover the source of the problem. That buckling of the floor from the uh, explosive decompression jammed the flight controls, where the cables ran through holes in the floor structure. The autopilot and manual control cables were both pinched by the collapsed floor. Jet! But because the autopilot uses hydraulics to move the cables, it can apply far more force on them than a human pilot. This is why the autopilot was able to control the plane ever so slightly. Hey, I've got some control here. What? But if the manual cables were jammed, why was the crew suddenly able to regain the control they needed to land the plane? A closer look at the pinched cables provides the answer. Looks like they saw their way out of this mess. They kept pulling as hard as they could on the yoke, pushing and pulling, turning. Come on! 
Deep scars in the hull's joists reveal what happened. The pinched control cables gradually carved grooves. They were actually cutting right into the metal during the long flight before they landed. That gave the crew enough maneuverability to line up with the runway. Anchorage, Reeve 8, ready to land, runway 6 right. Reeve 8, clear to land, runway 6 right. But it's Gibson's quick thinking that saved the day. Cut all engines! Emergency shutdown engines 1 and 3! I personally thought that was probably one of the smartest things that anybody ever did in the history of aviation. You've lost an engine. The only thing you have to rely on is literally your training as a pilot. And it makes all the difference in the world. Yet even the most skilled pilots mayday, mayday, mayday. may be powerless to stop rogue engines from causing devastation in a dense residential neighborhood. Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. An El Al cargo jet is fueled and ready to depart for Tel Aviv. El Al 1862, good evening. Good evening, LL 1862. Line up in sequence zero, 01 left. Roger. The Boeing 747 is under the command of Yitzhak Fuchs. He earned his wings in the Israeli military. Gedalia Sofa is the flight engineer. Clear for takeoff zero, 01 left. Roger. First officer Arnon Ohad will be handling the controls for this flight. On the roll. Engines are looking good. Climb power is set. For the first seven minutes of the flight, the plane climbs steadily over the Dutch capital. Without warning, the 747 rolls violently to the right. The crew has no idea why. I have control. You have control. Engines three and four are out. Both engines on the right wing have suddenly died. The captain tries to level the plane. We're losing hydraulics on system three. No, three and four. Critical flight controls begin to fail. LL1862. Mayday, mayday. We have an emergency. LL1862, do you wish to return to Schiphol? Affirmative. Mayday, mayday, mayday. We need to land. See if they can get us down on runway 27. Request runway 27 for landing. In that case, heading... 360, heading 360. You only have seven miles to go from current position. Damn it. There's no way that we can slow down at this distance. Captain Fuchs decides to descend and turn over Amsterdam so he can lose speed and altitude before coming in for an emergency landing at Schiphol Airport. Flaps two. Flaps two. All right, nice and easy. 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 No, 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 no. Uh, we're losing it. By going slower, he was having even more control problems than he already had. No, no, no! Come on! Going down! Going down, 1862, going down! I can't hold it! I can't hold it! Come on! LL 1862 has slammed into an 11 story residential block. The building is engulfed in flames. It's not until dawn that the full extent of the crash becomes apparent. 
No one aboard has survived. Another 43 people on the ground are dead. It's the worst aviation disaster in the history of the Netherlands. The Dutch government assigns Pim van Santen to lead the crash investigation. How soon can I get my team in here? Thank you. Jeez. There was a lot of pressure, both from the public, from the press, to come up with some findings as quickly as possible. Dig in, guys! We need those black boxes! City officials have ordered the crash debris to be taken to dump sites around Amsterdam. That's where NTSB's Bob Benson joins the team. Hang on. That's an engine part. It goes over there. You'd be surprised how much uh, building debris, pipes and things can actually look like airplane parts. It gets confusing. Within hours, witnesses provide a stunning lead. Just minutes before the crash, they saw what looked like two jet engines falling into Lake Goimir, a lake east of the airport. Losing two engines for us was... We've never heard of that before. The entire investigation hinges on the recovery of not one, but two engines at the bottom of a lake. The search of the lake pays off. The team recovers the two missing engines from the right wing. Thorough examination leads investigators to discover an unusual streak of paint on the cowling of the inboard engine. Let's see if the lab can tell us where this came from. In the meantime, the team recovers the flight data recorder. Its badly damaged condition means it'll go to NTSB headquarters in Washington, D.C. for analysis. Any luck? The cockpit voice recorder is never found. But there's a break in the case when the paint analysis results come in. The paint found on the engine came from the cone-shaped spinner at the front of another engine. Get everyone together. I think I know what happened. Van Santen believes there's only one possible scenario to explain the unusual finding. See? This is engine three. Paint transfer right there. No way engine four could come forward, but if engine three came off first, it could fly back and the spinner would hit right here. In other words, engine three knocked engine four off the plane. What the hell? Pim van Santen knows how engine four was knocked off the 747. Now he and his team have to determine why number three came off in the first place. They scrutinize the engine fitting, in particular, the crucial fuse pins which secure the pylon to the wing. A metallurgical scan leads to a stunning discovery there's a four millimeter crack on the inside of one of the fuse pins. If there's a micro crack in it, it weakens the entire structure and makes it easier to break. Once the fuse pin failed, the entire engine fitting would have broken apart. But there is still one more mystery to be solved. The damaged plane got within sight of the runway. No, 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 come on, going down. But why couldn't it make it all the way there?
The damaged tape from the flight data recorder has been repaired. Okay, let's get started. Pim Van Santen is now able to combine flight data. Engines are working fine at takeoff. With the recordings captured from the tower. Zero, roger. Then, right here, the pylon fails. Engine three breaks away. Engine three moves sideways, tears off the leading edge, and damages hydraulic lines before hitting engine four. We're losing hydraulics on system three, no, three and four. With half the hydraulics inoperable, the massive jet becomes increasingly difficult to balance and control. Mayday, mayday, we have an emergency. They put out the flaps to slow down. Flaps don't go out on the right side. Much like American Airlines Flight 191, some of the plane's hydraulics are so badly damaged that the wing flaps can't extend as they should. When the speed drops, so does the wing. Easy! No, 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 no! I'm losing it! More lift on the left, less on the right, causing a roll to the right. And as the aircraft slowed down, this rolling tendency got harder and harder to counteract. Come on! Going down, AK-6 is going down. Forty-three dead because of one small part. Investigators conclude that the accident is the result of the faulty fuse pin. The Dutch-led team immediately calls on Boeing to redesign the critical engine fastener. Boeing did a massive redesign of the pylons. To its credit, uh, the company knew they had a problem and they fixed it. The safety record of subsequent generations of airplanes says that problem has been solved. Three planes facing the nightmare of lost engines. Lives lost, lives saved. <laughs> but vital lessons learned from each investigation have made the skies safer. Good investigations of incidents and accidents that do happen cause changes in the industry for the good. And that, I think, is why the accident rate worldwide has just plummeted over the years.